Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mark Montaigne. I am the pastor of uh, the jail ministry. I oversee our renewal network. I'm the director of renewal. Um, what else do I do? Biblical counseling, something I do. I teach some biblical counseling skills. And one of my favorite things to do in the whole world is to, to work with married couples and, and individuals in a counseling setting. It's, uh, it's very rewarding, I guess I would say. To my left, we have Stephanie. She is amazing. She's a resident here in the Care Network. She's been with us for about three months. And, you know, I would say this about Stephanie. Her ability to be able to learn something and then intelligently articulate it in a way uh, uh, that everybody can understand, and she has a great accent, uh, is really, really fun. <laughs> and we have Krista Borgwart. She is a professional licensed counselor at City Care. And Krista's unique in the sense that she's a social worker that does, that does counseling. And that, that's a, I don't know how many people there are that do that, uh, but my understanding is it's a small number. Is that true? Uh, in our counseling facility. Yeah, only but, three, but, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're at City Care, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you haven't been here for a few weeks or if you're brand new to Christ Community at Church, we're in week three of a series called Finding Peace. Uh, we're going to, Mark's going to talk about this for three more weeks in Really, the goal in this is, you know, we all experience fear and anxiety, but how do I return back to a spirit of peace in my anxiety? We talk about sometimes you get stuck in the weeds or you get stuck in the forest and I don't know how to find my way out. Our hope is that uh, through this six-week series, we can help you to do some of that. So I'm a, a, what I would call a biblical counselor. Uh, like I said, I love working with people, but you know, there are some things that I, I believe are true. I believe that we have a wonderful counselor in Jesus Christ. There are a few reasons why I believe that. Let me, let me read something from Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah. It's chapter 9, verse 6. I think this, this gives us some insight from Isaiah into our hearts, into our lives, uh, that is proof positive to this end. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So to me, it's proof sitting right there in front of us all the time mm -hmm. in the text. But from a, in a personal sense, in interacting with men and women, there's a second thing that proves to me that Jesus is our Wonderful Counselor, and that is that I've seen the miracles that he's done in people's lives. I've seen individual men and women come to Christ in amazing ways. I've seen couples who are on the brink of divorce, who are on the brink of separation, and God working in their hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit has healed their lives, healed them personally, and healed their relationships, healed their marriage. And today, you know, there are dozens of people uh, that have worked with the counselors and with people in the care network, uh, Wendell and our team, that are, they could stand here today and they could say, it's because of Jesus, my life is different. My relationship with my wife or my husband is different. With my children, with my coworkers, it's different. And we, we love doing that. We love doing this work. So thank you for the opportunity. You know, it's, what's true is that sometimes things other than God capture our thoughts. For you, maybe it's your children. I know that for my wife and I, that's been true in our lives. I know for Krista it is, and someday it'll be true for you. <laughs> right? I have hopes and dreams for them. I have hopes and dreams that they'll succeed in sports or dance or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, when I came here to become a pastor, I was thinking about what my career might look like moving forward. Maybe that's true for you. Maybe you're going to take a new job and you've got to move out of state and your thoughts are captivated by, well, what will, what will happen? How will this work out? Maybe you've been thinking about a coach in Florida whose name is Scott Frost who is coming to Lincoln to be the coach of the Nebraska Cornhuskers. I know that we're pretty excited about that, and that's captured some of our thoughts and imaginations for a couple of weeks. For others, there are things that are much more serious, though. For others, there may be an illness that you're dealing with personally, or maybe an illness of a loved one. And just maybe you're asking questions like, what will become of me? How will my, hand, my family deal with this? How will, will they be taken care of? And those are difficult questions to, to respond to sometimes. But in faith, 
was walk hand in hand with the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ in our lives, we can overcome those fears and anxieties and we can experience peace. Today I would say that I work with multiple couples as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago and they're in the midst of some of this pain. I have somebody who I work closely with here at CCC and that person's experiencing an illness that is gonna be very challenging. And as a pastor, I have to recognize that there are threats in the world that I just can't, I simply can't ignore. What's true in all of that, and I, I want to make sure I communicate this as best as I can. So I've learned that in becoming a Christian, I should expect anxiety sometimes. I should expect fear. And, you know, it's in that expectation that some things will be challenging in my life that I have a heart that's being prepared a heart that's being, and a mind that's being prepared for those challenges when they come. Now, should we all experience some level of joy and peace as well? Absolutely. Jesus promises us that. But it's in those times where I, I know that, hey, I've got to be prepared for when this may come, uh, that I have that opportunity to grow and to learn and, and take information that I've learned from people and from God and, and turn it into formation in my heart where I, I grow and become a new man in Christ or new woman in Christ, right? So I, I want to read a quote to you. It's, it's from Dr. Robert Kellerman. He's a founding member of the American Association of Christian Counselors. He says this, As spiritual beings, we long for communion with God. As social beings, we long for connection with each other. And as self-aware beings, we long for a conscious sense of personal peace. I totally agree with that. And, you know, one of the amazing things about that is that Jesus responds to us. He responds to that comment. He says this in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. So people come into the office and they'll say, well, how do I do that? How do I actually achieve that level of peace? People have actually said, I see this peace that exists inside of you, and I want that in my own life. How do you do that? Well, we have some, some people with us today that are going to help us answer some of those questions, right? So ladies, are you, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So, Stephanie, since you've got here, you have been pouring into this study on anxiety. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I'd really love for you to share with everybody is, what have you learned? Yeah. Let me tell you a little bit about what I have been studying. So, anxiety is a defensive action that we all experience it once in a while. For example, back when we were at school, when we had to do this big test or a final exam, we get that stress, that anxiety, or when we're walking down the road and we hear this dog barking and running towards us, we get anxious, we get stressed. Or even right now, I'm talking in front of all of you guys, I'm feeling that stress, that anxiety. But actually, anxiety is born from fear, which is God gave it to us as a gift to keep us safe. It's natural and beneficial. But the enemy has uh, transformed it into something negative with his lies. So he turned that fear that was meant to keep us safe into the thought of, I'm not good enough. And this can be presented in different ways. For example, my body is not good enough or strong enough to fight this disease, or my mind is not well enough or prepared enough to fight anxiety. So it can be presented in different ways and targeting each area of our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, but God knew this beforehand. So he says in his word, in 1 Peter 5 eight, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. Mm. So he knew that the devil was going, going to attack our mind. So we just need to be watchful. We need to spend time in prayer and just seeking God. Yeah, I love the illustration you give. We have uh, the, the dog barking. If we're walking down the sidewalk and on the other side of the fence, we hear a dog barking at us. Our bodies react to that. Right. That's, right? How, do the, how does our, Tell us about how does your body react? I think we all know, but... Yeah, well, your heart does start racing. You have these thoughts of just like running away. Mm -hmm. your, you get goosebumps and mm -hmm. yeah, your breathing starts uh, getting faster. It's just 
your body just does this automatically just to protect itself. But then we, when, we, when we have a conscious thought mm -hmm. that we, okay, the dog's on the other side of the fence, right? Right. And I don't have to be afraid. Our body might take a couple of minutes to kind of process some of what just happened, mm -hmm. but we can walk away with the, the idea that I'm okay. Yeah. I'm safe, right? Yeah, that's the power that God gave us to just control our thoughts, mm -hmm. to discern if the situation is actually a threat or if we're just fine. It's just situational. It will go away and we will be just fine. Great job, Steph. <laughs> so there's this other idea that there are what are called common features of anxiety. And for you, Krista, to share some of that with us, that would be amazing. Yeah, sure. So the anxious thoughts activate the brain, which activates the nervous system. And so the nervous system is going to do some of the things that Stephanie was sharing. So like we're all nervous to be up here. So, you know, if it was... It's that stress response was created so that we could be safe if there was a threat. This is clearly not a threat, but our bodies are still saying, I am nervous, so our hearts are racing and the blood's pumping. Um, but so a lot of times when that stress response keeps happening, there's other things. So you get that muscle tension, headaches, you get um, the cognitive part. So like all week I couldn't remember things constantly. I was forgetting things. And you just make more mistakes, things like that. So um, also then the body shuts down parts of our system that, we, that it feels that we don't need. Mm -hmm. So right, you have less saliva created because you don't need mm -hmm. that if you are in a threatening sit situation. Um, and then what happens though is if that continues to happen, that chronic anxiety and chronic stress, mm -hmm. that's where we get more physical illnesses. You know, the heart disease, infertility, mm -hmm. things that premature aging, other things. And that's when we'd really like to see people get professional help. Mm -hmm. And so that's some of it. Well, we're glad you're here. It's, uh, how does that work out for you? Like for me, uh, I get knots in my stomach. Mm -hmm. And I can always tell that I need to take a break, mm -hmm. take a couple of deep breaths, and relax mm -hmm. a little bit when those knots start to form. Could, how yeah. about for you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, part of mine is naming it to tame it, right? So mm -hmm. as soon as I know, I go, okay, this isn't really a threat. Yeah. I'm just on stage. And to do some of that processing. And also, I'm really relational, so I'll talk to really encouraging people who give me scripture and things like that. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. <clears throat> So you said something that's really interesting, and we're going to come back to you for the brain science on this, but uh, fear is a gift. I think sometimes we have a difficult time getting to that place where I can say, oh, yeah, fear is a gift. Help us to understand that a little bit more, if you would. Yeah, so fear is a natural and healthy response meant to keep us away from danger, and it is a gift from God to keep us safe. I was reading um, this magazine, Parents Magazine, mm -hmm. and it said that at the age of 10 months, babies start feeling anxiety or fearful thoughts. So I was watching this video where this baby girl was placed in front of a glass uh, floor. It was covering a large gap, mm -hmm. which was on top of a big, deep fall. Mm -hmm. And the first time she was there, she was oblivious to heights, so she went right away and crossed it without even thinking twice. Mm -hmm. A few weeks later, when she was around 10 months, old, uh, she was placed in front of the glass again, and she wouldn't cross it. Without even um, being aware of it, she developed this uh, fear for heights. Her mother was in the other side of the glass telling her, you will be fine, just come here, you'll be okay, I got you, but she wouldn't cross it. Mm -hmm. So here we can see how God plays this fear in our lives to keep us safe from different situations. Mm -hmm. What would have happened if this baby wouldn't have had that? I mean, it was a study, but in real life, I mean, <laughs> should have fall. Um, our society teaches us that self-sufficiency is good, that we can do everything by ourselves, that we're strong enough, healthy enough, smart enough. But the moment that we fail, these thoughts of self-sufficiency become the thought of I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And that is where the anxiety kicks in and all these negative thoughts that just take you down that bad path. Mm -hmm. um, God tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Mm -hmm. So God didn't give us an identity of fearful people. He gave us a spirit of power, love, and self-control. Mm -hmm. Power to be able to control these thoughts um, and take them to the right place where God wants them to be. Love to be in relationship with others, to be able to fight anxiety and fearful thoughts. Mm -hmm. And because God made us relational, mm -hmm. as you were saying, yeah. And self-control so that we can guide our thoughts, our fearful thoughts, into a place of surrender to the 
a wonderful counselor and the Prince of Peace. Just a fun fact for you guys to know, Fear is actually found 353 times in 340 verses. So it is not for in the Bible. God knows what he's talking about, and he placed it there for a reason. Yeah, it's interesting in that video how the mother is standing on the other side of the glass, mm -hmm. and the baby's rocking. She wants to go forward right. to her mom, but she just, at that 10-month period, once she's become self-aware to mm -hmm. some degree, she just won't go. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. So the brain science behind fear, mm -hmm. wow, that's got to be a huge, how many years did you have to study that? Several. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, And I'm I sure. still study it because neuroscience has only been like the last 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a new study, so we're still learning all the time. Yeah. Yeah, but do you want a glimpse? I think that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. a little glimpse. So <laughs> the brain automatically records, and what's fascinating about that is how our senses play into that. So like if there was an accident, everybody would have a different account based on their senses. Mm -hmm. And your brain would record, like for me, it might be I'm heightened with sense of smell. Mm -hmm. So it might be a smell associated with that. And that's important for some of our anxiety because mm -hmm. then we know what's setting me off a little bit or for some trauma stuff too, which I won't even get into. Um, and then there's other parts of with that brain, how it works is if I would have said no to this fear of speaking today, I would have confirmed that this was something that I'm supposed to fear. My brain would record that. And that's really important when we work with clients. We really go through what are you fearful of, and we slowly try and get them to lean into it because the brain will say, oh, I need to fear that every single, you know, it'll just say that's what I'm supposed to do. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, police have this, when they interview somebody within the first few hours, the, the ability to be able to recall that information is pretty low. But after 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, that, that increases to a great degree. Is mm -hmm. it, help us to understand that a little bit of how the brain works. Well, with the brain on that, it's, it depends on the person. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's, it is how we're wired. And if you're really anxious, you're going to remember less. Like I said, that cognitive fog. Mm -hmm. right. So if it was more traumatic for you, mm -hmm. then that's going to take more time. And then it just depends. Some people are more wired in that left brain, and they can be really, if you, the police said it, mm -hmm. what is it? They go, da 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 Me, I'm a slow processor, so it might take yeah, me yeah. more like five days. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same. <laughs> it's a, well, it's sometimes what we experience is that, uh, what I would say is the Holy Spirit protects people's thoughts when mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the word trauma. When trauma comes, uh, it's really hard. It's not something that's in my conscious thought. It, take some digging. The pain may be there from an emotion, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it takes a little bit of digging and a little bit of prayer. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay, so how, what do I do with all this, right? So we're sitting here and we're talking about all these things. What do I do with this? Uh, I have to say that as we talk about all of these things, prayer is important. Prayer is super important in all of this. And when Stephanie came here and she starts talking about her life and how she grew up and what a relationship with her mother and her father is like, you know, I really started to recognize that she has this amazing gift, this gift that was given to her by her mom, and it's the gift of prayer over many, many years. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to stop talking and let you tell us. <laughs> tell us about you and your mom and your prayer life, if you will. Yeah. This had a great impact in my life. This made me the person that I am today. When I was really little, my mom would pray with me every morning, every night, or during every meal. And it was just great. That relationship that I had with my mom, that loving, caring relationship, uh, drew me closer to God. And I learned to learn who he is, his nature, how much he loves me, and how much he cares for me. And it also made me understand who he made me to be, how much he loves me, and who he um, built me to be, and what skills he gave me. So that was just a great way to connect with my mom through relationship and know our God. So, and today my mom is thousands of miles away, mm -hmm. back in Ecuador where I'm from. But God still puts people in my life, like my amazing husband that mm -hmm. just makes me feel the love of God. Mm -hmm. And it's through relationships that we can actually overcome the anxiety mm -hmm. through prayer to know who our God is, to know how much he loves us, and to know who he made us to be. Amen. Couldn't agree with you more. It's uh, We know some people who have been praying for family members for years and years, uh, hoping that the prayer would right. reach that person's heart. And, mm -hmm. and we've seen the evidence of how those prayers have been uh, granted by God. And, and faith has become the result of that. It's pretty fun. Yeah. 
Okay, so back again, right? So yeah. help us to understand all of this a little bit more, if you would, from a brain science perspective. Brain and relationship, yeah. I'm going to read you a quote from Dr. Daniel Siegel. So he's an interpersonal neurobiologist, which sounds like... Well, a that's a big cool. word. Yeah, and a pretty cool job, I would think, right? <laughs> Maybe that's the next thing. I don't know. Um, we'll pray for you. you thank you. <laughs> the brain is a social organ, and our relationships with one another are not a luxury, but an essential nutrient for our survival. I just, when I read that, I like to read a lot of his books. And I, that just blew me away that God wired us for we. Our brain is a social organ. And when we study that, the left brain is that logical, it's where that thinking stuff happens with anxiety. And kind of someone told me once, like, it's binge thinking. But the right side of the brain is the we. And when I work with clients, I always talk to them about connecting from your head to your heart. And the heart is that relationship. And God's given us some amazing stuff, like hugging. When I hug my kids, I get some oxytocin, which I don't tell them. But, you know, I'm healing from that, and it's beautiful. Also, when we play, when you watch little kids play or you play as adults, me and my friends, we text, let's play together, because you get dopamine, the good stuff in the brain that's healing and, and calms you down. And then for me personally, that quiet time with God and prayer and meditation and that's just healing, and that's my relationship with he, me and him. And I'm a newer Christian as an adult, and I have a friend who, she would always talk about getting down on your knees and prayer, and that's that vulnerability of me being willing to have that with God and say, yeah, I'm not self-sufficient, and I need you. And I find that very healing. And then as a couples counselor, I love when I was thinking for this prepping that it's great because a guy gets down on his one knee in vulnerability, to start off that marriage and how important vulnerability is and healing and that integration of left and right brain. Yeah, Brene Brown says a lot about vulnerability, right? Yes, and I our ability her. to heal and about relationship. Mm -hmm. Give us a little insight into what Mrs. Dr. Brown says. Oh, Brene Brown is amazing. I just lent out one of my clients one of her books called The Gifts of Imperfection. And she's just all about being real and authentic, which from a Christian perspective is great that that's healing and that, that we all desire that and that's where we're going to get into that right brain when we stop overdoing it over here mm -hmm. and we let go and we get real with each other we can get that healing and get more of the oxytocin and yeah. you know we might be more likely to snuggle up in our marriage if we're just getting real right you know, a few yeah. years ago at leadership summit we had the opportunity to experience dr brown and this vulnerability piece and man it's blew some of our minds we we're so mm -hmm. excited to hear what she had to say because it reinforces you know it's this it's unique in the sense that when we talk about relationship and healing and relationship and prayer with your mom and all the experiences that you had with her, you know, God is three in one. Mm -hmm. God is ultimately in, in relationship. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it's an amazing example to us that, you know, it's actually I have a quote here I want to read to you and it, it reinforces this idea to some degree. This is again from Dr. Kellum and it says this. Our emotions reveal our deepest questions about God. They vocalize the inner workings of the soul. Listen to and ponder your emotions to discern what your heart is doing with God and others. They are a voice that can tell us how we are dealing with a fallen, hurtful world. Emotions force open the stuck window of our soul, compelling us to consider how we are facing life. And I want to reread one sentence here. Listen to and ponder your emotions to discern what your heart is doing with God and others. You know, as, as Jen and Stephanie prepare for an anxiety group uh, in renewal next beginning in January, you know, that, it's a relational, it's an relational event. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to be all of these young women coming together to talk about fear and anxiety and mm -hmm. how they can make their way back to peace. And that's, there's discernment in that. You know, I, I think of counselors. You know, what an amazing gift to be able to have somebody who's, who's studied and understands these things from a counseling perspective, from a Christian perspective, to be able to discern with somebody what that's like for me to overcome my fear and anxiety. So thank you to both of you without question. So as we start to wrap up here, there's some practical things we can do too. And you've talked about exercise being something that's really important to you. Help, help us to understand how exercise is beneficial for you in overcoming fear and anxiety, if you would. Yeah, so actually exercising is one of my favorite things to do when I'm feeling anxious or stressed because it takes your mind off of those situations. 
And you don't necessarily need to go to a gym. Uh, what I do is just look at a video online on YouTube and just do a 20, 30 minute workout. Or sometimes just by going outside, walking or running and just enjoying the nature and what God blessed us with. Mm. Just a time to reflect and a time to be quiet in silence and mm. yeah, just enjoying and taking care of uh, the body that God gave us and just be connecting with God through nature. And the fact, to, uh, the fact of being exercising, uh, as Krista was saying, it releases some chemicals in your brain that make you feel energized, mm. happier and as healing. Mm -hmm. yeah, just as they have to work out our minds, working out our bodies is right. pretty important, right? Mm -hmm. So y you said something to me before I met Krista for the first time about mm -hmm. uh, some meditation she did with another group. And it's, uh, you know, sometimes the word meditation can be just a little bit strange. It kind of, it could possibly bring about the, this thought of Eastern philosophy. That's, it's, when I went back and looked at this, I was like, all right, meditation, let me figure this out. So I, I did a suit search on Bible Gateway, and meditate actually shows up 16 times in the Old Testament. But most profoundly, it shows up a ton in David's life in the Psalms. And he's talking about meditating on God, meditating on the gifts that he's given him, meditating on the life and the air that he breathes. It's, it's an amazing gift. So I'm, I'm hopeful that you'll lead us through a little exercise in meditation. Sounds good. Thank you. I just want to say before that that this is going to be a guided body scan meditation. And people ask me, you know, can kids and teenagers do this? Definitely. I would recommend it for them. Uh, it is very healing. So the first thing I'm just going to invite you guys to do is gently close your eyes. And if you can get comfortable in your seats. And then gently place your hands in your lap. Take a long, slow, deep breath in. Hold it for a moment, and then slowly exhale. Just allow any tension to melt away as you gradually relax more and more deeply with each breath. Take another long, slow, deep breath in. Hold it, and then exhale. Empty your lungs completely with your out breath. Take a third deep breath in, slowly filling your lungs. Hold it for a moment and then let it go. Continue to breathe slowly and gently. Relax. Now bring your awareness to the top of your head. Notice any sensations. Then let go of any tension. Shift your awareness to your forehead. Let the muscles in your forehead and temples relax. Allow your eyes to relax. Bring your attention to your jaw. Notice any sensations or tensions. Allow your jaw to soften and let go of all the tension. Now this peaceful feeling flows down your neck and deep into the muscles in your shoulders, soothing them releasing them. Allow this peaceful feeling to flow through your arms, relaxing and soothing all the way to the tips of your fingers. Now the peaceful sensation flows through your chest and your stomach. Feel how this area gently rises and falls as you breathe, slowly and deeply, soothing and relaxing. Bring your awareness to your back. Notice if there are any discomforts there. Allow your back to completely relax. Then feel this relaxing sensation flow all the way down your spine. Now bring gentle attention to your legs. Notice any sensations and tensions. Allow any tension to soften. Soothing feelings flow down through your knees and into your calves. Bring your attention to your feet. Notice any tension. Relax your feet all the way to the tips of your toes. Your entire body is soft, calm, and relaxed. Take a moment to thank God for your body, the body he blessed you with. 
I invite you to take a long, slow, deep breath in. Hold it for a moment and then fully exhale. When you are ready, gently begin to bring your awareness back to the room in God's presence and love. That was good. Thank you. You're welcome. And I could feel the, I didn't really feel like I had any tension in my shoulders, but mm -hmm. when we went to the shoulder piece, that, uh, I felt them relax a little bit and my feet fell off the end of my chair. That's really great. You know, how do we, uh, some people asked in the first hour, after the first hour, how do I do that again? I, I thought that was good for me. Um, you can watch well, you should go to CCC and watch the videos all the time, but this is a great opportunity for you to <laughs> reconnect and say, hey, I want to go back, and I want to try that again, what Krista did with us. So thank you so much for helping us to experience that today. You're welcome. Yeah. You know, as we close, I have to say that uh, this has been a great experience. It's been great to get to know the both of you a little bit better, right? Uh, but I'm so thankful that you guys said yes. So thankful that you said yes to come in and and being a part of this today, and thankful for being asked as well. You know, the next song that's gonna come up is Lord, I Need You. And I would invite all of you into a spirit of prayer as we prepare to hear the whole team worship with us. So Lord, as we come together, I can't think of a more fitting lyric than Lord, I Need You. Lord, I need you, oh, how I need you, every moment, every day. Lord, when we experience a spirit of fear or anxiety or some other negative emotion in our lives, Lord, I, I pray that you would come to us. I pray that we would call out your name, that we would reach out to you in our time of need, and that we would rest in your amazing grace, and that that, that thought would be in our minds when we have an opportunity uh, to experience your grace, and we would call out and say, Lord, I need you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.